Hi everyone, I'm pleased to welcome all of you to the first session of a Bible study that will deal with the book of Revelation. This is uh, the most difficult book to understand and it's the most misunderstood, misinterpreted book in the Bible. The reason for that is uh, because it's written mainly in symbolic language and unless people understand the meaning of the symbols they won't be able to uh, get to the true message which is uh, conveyed to the reader. <clears throat> Let us start this session by a brief uh, prayer. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, the Bible, which serves as a lamp that sheds light on our pathway and shows us the right way to live. At this time, when we undertake the study of the book of Revelation, we invite the Holy Spirit to be our primary teacher. Illuminate our minds and help us understand the mysteries of this prophetic book. May what we study today lead us not to condemnation, but to full salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. We will study this book chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And uh, one of the principles of Bible study that I have always followed is to allow the Bible to interpret itself. Whenever we come across a word or a phrase that is used somewhere else in the Bible, we will refer to that because it will shed a lot of light on the verse that we are dealing with. However, if we find a phrase or a word that is not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible, then we go to the secular literature that was produced at that time and see how it's used in the contemporary secular uh, literature and often we can get a clue to its right meaning. So we'll avoid speculation as much as we can. People get into trouble when they study this book of faith because they start guessing, speculating. Uh, we will not, will attempt not to do that. So let's start. Let, uh, we'll try to cover one chapter each session. So today we'll cover chapter, the first chapter, which is not a long chapter anyway. And this serves as an introduction as an introduction to our study. First of all, this, this book, the book of Revelation, is called the Apocalypse in Greek. The Greek word Apocalypse means disclosing, revealing what is hidden. So the Apostle John received some visions from God and he uses symbolic language and we have to unlock those symbols to understand what is being revealed to us here. This book was written by the Apostle John, there is no doubt about it. One of the early church fathers, Irenaeus, who lived in the 2nd century AD, says John wrote the book of Revelation. And so does Eusebius, who is uh, the early church historian who lived in the 4th century. You know, the first church historian is Luke. He wrote the Acts of the Apostles. And Eusebius takes, uh, starts writing from the time the last of the apostles died until the 4th century. So both Eusebius, who is considered the, the early church historian of the time, and Irenaeus, one of the church fathers who lived in the 2nd century, both attest to the fact that the Apostle John wrote this uh, book, the book of Revelation. So there is no doubt about 
the authenticity of its authorship. The Apostle John was an early disciple of Jesus. He was a fisherman from Galilee. Uh, he was the son of Zebedee, the brother of James. And he wrote the Gospel of John, the fourth Gospel, and the three general epistles of John, and the book of Revelation. We'll start reading with verse 1. The re revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Here we're told the way the Apostle Paul received uh, these visions that are recorded in the book of Revelation. Uh, these visions are a revelation of Jesus Christ that were conveyed to Apostle John through the mediation of an angel. The name of the angel is not mentioned, but we can assume it was the angel Gabriel because he's the one who communicates God's messages to different people. Like he was the one who who appeared to the Virgin Mary and told her that God had chosen her to be the vehicle of bringing his son into the world. So, <clears throat> then these visions were communicated to Apostle John by Christ, not directly, but through the mediation of an angel. This is not a foreign thought to the Jews, because the Jews believe that the law of Moses, not the Ten Commandments, but the law of Moses, which is contained in Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, were communicated to Moses through the ministry of angels. The Talmud says this, and there are references to that in the, in the New Testament, like in Acts chapter 7, verse 35, Stephen, before he was stoned to death, after being accused of blasphemy, tells the Jewish religious leaders, he says, uh, the people of Israel have received the law by the mediation of angels and have not kept it. So they received the law, but they did not keep it. How did they receive it? Through the mediation of angels. And, and this is a thought which is expressed in the Talmud, that the law was given to Moses through the mediation of angels. Another clue for that is in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2, where the Old and New Covenants are compared and contrasted. Uh, there the, right, the, uh, the author of the epistle to the Hebrews says, if the message spoken by angels was binding, was valid, and every transgression and every disobedience received its right punishment, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? So he's telling us that uh, the, the word spoken by angels, meaning the law, the law of Moses, was binding, was valid, and everyone who disobeyed it received a just punishment. Then how can we escape uh, such, uh, such how can we escape if we ignore, if we neglect the great salvation that was uh, achieved through the atoning death of Jesus Christ? Okay, so the concept that this, uh, this revelation of Jesus was transmitted to the Apostle John through the mediation of angels is not something foreign to the Jewish mind. Every Jew accepted this and they had no problem with it. Now notice verse uh, 3, he says, Blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy. You know, in ancient times, books were rare and very expensive. So, when the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation, he sent a copy to one church. Every church had a reader. 
people would assemble in the church, the reader would read uh, aloud, and everyone else would be listening. Because not everyone was able to read and write, and not everyone could afford to buy a book, because books were written on parchment, on uh, the skin of uh, animals, or on papyrus. And they were expensive and very rare. So when the Apostle uh, John wrote this book and sent the messages to seven churches, in each church there was one reader. So the first church would get the message, have all the church members gathered at one place, the reader would read it aloud and people would listen and then the same copy would be passed on to the other church and the third and the fourth and this way it circulated among the Christians. So there's a blessing pronounced for all those who hear this prophecy or who study this prophecy. So there is a blessing uh, for us also. Okay, we go to, to verse 4 now. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia. The province of Asia here refers to Asia Minor. Asia Minor in the Roman, during the Roman Empire was called the province of Asia. So Asia Minor is today's Turkey. The country known today as Turkey was Asia Minor and a large part of it was Western Armenia. Unfortunately now it's in Turkey. Uh, the eastern, the western part was uh, part of historical Armenia and then the, the area, the northern part belonged to Greeks, was populated by the Pontic Greeks. We know that these areas have been ethnically cleansed by the Turks. There are no Pontic Greeks living now in the northern part and there are no Armenians in uh, Eastern Turkey, what, uh, what used to be Western Armenia. Okay, here is his customary greeting. Grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So this is his customary greeting grace and peace. The Apostle Paul also uses the same greeting, grace and peace, by starting every episode. And this greeting comes from him who was and is and is to come, that's God, meaning he has no beginning and no end, and from the seven spirits. Now there are no seven spirits. There's one spirit, the Holy Spirit. But the the number seven in the Bible denotes completion. So the idea here is that the Holy Spirit in his fullness is greeting the seven churches. Uh, and then Jesus Christ. You see here is the Trinity. In this verse all the, uh, the members of Holy Trinity are re mentioned or referred to. God who is, who was, and is to come, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. You have the Trinity here. One verse we have, one phrase we have to zero on is the firstborn from the dead. Jesus is called the firstborn from the dead. What does this phrase mean? It's important for us to understand it. Fortunately, there are references to it elsewhere in the Bible that help us to uncover the real meaning of this phrase, and it's very, very important. Now, in, uh, if we go to the book of Psalms, Psalms, Psalm 89, verse 20, God says, I have found David my servant, with my holy oil I have anointed him. The kings of Israel were anointed with holy oil, the way the priests were anointed, the kings were also anointed. Now look at verse 27, Psalm 89, verse 27. Uh, 
it says, and I, God is talking, I will make him, King David, I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So the word firstborn means, has two meanings. First, the first child born into a family. All right? And the second meaning is preeminence, because David was not the firstborn in his family. He was the lastborn. He was the youngest of his brothers. So David, who was the lastborn, God, tell, God tells us he made him his firstborn. So to be made the firstborn means to become preeminent. Did you get me? This is very a very important point. So when God says, I have found David, my servant, I anointed him with oil, and I will make him the firstborn. And then he explains what he means, the highest of the kings of the earth. So <clears throat> God took David, an insignificant land, lad, made him the firstborn of all the kings of the earth who lived at that time. So when David lived, he was the greatest among the kings of the earth. So when God says, I made David the firstborn, means he made him the preeminent king on the earth. So the firstborn means preeminence. It, it does not only refer to the order of birth, it also means preeminence. When, when God says that he has made someone his firstborn, means he has honored him, he has given him preeminence. He has he's made him a prominent person. There's another reference to it in Genesis chapter 41 verses uh, Genesis chapter 41 verses 51-52 talks about Joseph, the patriarch Joseph. We know he had two sons. His first son, the elder one, was Manasseh and the younger one was Ephraim. Now let's see what God talk, says about the two sons of Joseph in Jeremiah 31 verse 9. God says, I am a father to Israel. Israel was, is called in the Old Testament, the son of God. All right. So God says, I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. He says, Ephraim is my firstborn, not Manasseh. And why? We know that Manasseh was involved in, in the worship of pagan gods. He was involved in witchcraft. He was highly immoral in character and he sacrificed his son to a pagan god. So God was not pleased with him. God was displeased with Manasseh. Although he was the firstborn, God says, I, Israel, Ephraim is my firstborn, not Manasseh. God rejected Manasseh and made Ephraim the firstborn, meaning Ephraim became the prominent one. So, the firstborn means preeminence. It refers not only to the order of birth, it also means preeminence. As I said, King David was the last born in his family, but God made him the preeminent king on the earth. Is this understood? Now we go to next next verse. To him who loves us, and has freed us from the sins by his blood, that's Jesus Christ, who, who saved us by the shedding of his blood on Calvary, and has made us a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to serve his God and Father, to him be the glory power forever and ever. This is the end of the doxology. <laughs> okay, it starts with a greeting and then follows it with a doxology, and the doxology ends here. So Jesus has saved us by the shedding of his blood and has made us a kingdom of priests. If you read the epistle to the Hebrews, it says Jesus Christ is our high priest and every believer in him is a priest. Now the priest was a mediator between God and the people. Uh, people in Old Testament lands could not approach God directly, they needed the mediation of priests. But in the New Testament, Jesus Christ is our high priest 
we can approach him directly without the mediation of a human priest because every believer, every Christian believer is a priest. Okay? So in the New Testament, every Christian believer is a priest. Every male believer is a priest. Every woman believer is a priest. There is no distinction. There is no gender distinction there. So everyone who believes in Christ is a priest in, uh, in the New Testament. So we don't need the ministry of a human priest. Because Christ is our high priest and is approachable, we can directly go to him and have our petitions, requests presented to him. Okay. Verse 7. Look, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all the people of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Okay, now this verse refers to the second coming of Christ and says, Every eye shall see him. When Jesus comes on the clouds of heaven, every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him. Meaning, the people who were responsible for Jesus' death would be able to see Jesus come, accompanied by all his angels in all his glory and power. The first time he came in humiliation, the second time he will come in exaltation. So, how can every eye see Jesus when he comes? If you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, talks about Christ's second coming. It says, Jesus will come accompanied by all the angels and all his saints and he will send his angels to gather his elect from the four corners of the earth and we the believers who happen to be alive at that time will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air that's very important we will meet the Lord in the air to be caught up is a reference to the rapture so we would Jesus, when he comes the second time, his feet will not touch the earth. He'll hover around the planet. We'll see him, but his feet will not touch the earth, will not touch the ground. We will be caught up, that's the rapture. We'll meet him in the air. And he'll transport us to his heavenly kingdom. Okay, so, <clears throat> you remember... When the Russians, the Soviet Russians, launched the Sputnik on October 4, 1957, it was the first human-made artificial satellite to orbit the Earth. And uh, I remember I was in Jerusalem at the time, and uh, they announced it over the radio that the Sputnik would pass over Jerusalem on a certain day, at a certain hour, and I remember many young people, we ascended the highest, uh, we went to the roof of the highest building, got our binoculars and watched the skies, and then we saw a bright, bright light sliding across the horizon, and that was Sputnik. So, it orbited the Earth every 97 minutes. Every 97 minutes, it completed one orbit of the Earth. And it orbited, it made 1,440 orbits around the Earth before its batteries died out <laughs> and it crashed. But people all around the world were able to see the Sputnik artificial satellite at different times within a span of one day within the span of one day, but at different hours. So the same thing will happen when Jesus comes, every eye shall see him. People say, how can every eye see Jesus when we are living on a globe? The world is round, it's a, like a globe. How can every eye see him? Well, it's because his feet will not touch the earth, he'll hover around the, the planet, and within a span of one day or a shorter period of time, all the people, will see him. You remember when Jesus was uh, 
Condemned by Caiaphas, the high priest, he was condemned to death on charges of blasphemy. He told Caiaphas, you have no authority over me except that which, is, which has been given to you. And he said, from now on, you will see the Son of Man or the Son of God coming on the, on the, on the clouds of glory. So Jesus will come the second time uh, riding on a cloud. You remember in Acts chapter 1 when the disciples uh, saw Jesus' uh, ascension from Bethany, which was on the western slope of the Mount of Olives. Uh, they were amazed, astonished, two angels appeared and said, This same Jesus, whom you saw going up, will come again in the same manner as you saw him go up into heaven. That's Acts chapter 1, verse 19. So, Jesus went up, riding on a cloud, will come down, will come the second time, riding on a cloud. Uh, he was, if the ascension was visible, the second coming will be visible. Jesus will not come in a secret. Okay. Verse 8, I'm Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was, who is to come, the Almighty. Alpha and Omega. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Meaning, Jesus is the beginning and the end and everything in between. Everything in between the Alpha and Omega is included. He is Lord over all. Alright, verse 9. John. Your brother and companion in the suffering. Here John identifies himself. John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Of Jesus. On the Lord's day I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like the trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. Okay, so the Apostle John received this vision while he lived in exile on the island of Patmos. The island of Patmos was a Greek island, it's still a Greek island, it's about 30 about 50 miles southwest of Ephesus. Ephesus was an important uh, city during the time uh, of Roman rule. It was a uh, cultural and trade center. It had a very important harbor. It was a center for trade and culture. So this uh, island, the island of Patmos is a tiny rocky island. It's just 16 square miles. The Romans use it as a prison. <laughs> they, whenever somebody was uh, committed a crime or an offense, instead of putting him in jail, they shipped him to the island of Patmos. So all un the undesirables <laughs> were sent to the island of Patmos. Uh, it was like the Alcatraz of the Roman Empire. It was surrounded by sea, no, no, no prisoner could escape. The Apostle John was exiled to this island because of the word of God, we're told. He was exiled by the Emperor Domitian, who ruled between 81 AD and 96, 95, 96 AD. He was the one, Emperor Domitian was the one who persecuted the Christians who lived in Asia Minor and he exiled uh, John who was the pastor of the Christian church in Ephesus, exiled him to this Patmos island. We don't know how long he stayed there on the island of Patmos, but we know he was released uh, by Nerva, the emperor who followed Domitian. When Domitian died, he was succeeded by Emperor Nerva, N-E-R-V-A, and he released the Apostle John, and he was able to return to Ephesus 
in 96 AD. In the year 96 AD, that's when he wrote the book of Revelations. There are some people who believe that he wrote it while living on the, in exile on the island of Patmos. But I believe most probably he wrote it after his release when he was back in Ephesus. Because on that island he didn't have the supplies to write. I believe he received the visions when he was on Patmos, but he didn't have papyra pages, he didn't have parchments, uh, ink, those things that were necessary for him to write. Anyway, he was on this Patmos island, exiled by the Roman Emperor Domitian for his Christian faith, where he remained as a prisoner between 8 and 10 years, then he was released, returned to Ephesus, and uh, continued to pastor the church in Ephesus until his death. Now he says, he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. <laughs> he received the first vision on the Lord's day. Which day is the Lord's day? We all know the Lord's if you look it up in the Greek New Testament, it says Kuriati. Kuriati in Greek means the Lord's Day. In Armenian, what do we call Sunday? We call it Giragi. Giragi in Armenian means nothing. <laughs> uh, the root of Giragi is not Armenian. Giragi doesn't come from an Armenian root, and so it has no literal meaning in Armenian. But it's the transliteration, the Armenian transliteration of the Greek Kuriati. And Kuriati is the first day of the week, Sunday. So the, the, in the New Testament, Saturday, which is the Jewish Sabbath, is always called Sabbaton. Sabbaton is the Greek for Sabbath. The... The seventh day Sabbath, Saturday, is never called Kuriaki in the New Testament. Kuriaki in the New Testament always refers to the first day of the week, to Sunday. Of course, this doesn't add sanctity to Sunday because the vision could have been given on any day of the week. But he were told that the Apostle John received his first vision uh, on a Sunday. Now look at verse 12. Or the seven churches are mentioned here. And uh, he was told, he was commanded to write what he heard and what he saw on a scroll and send it to the seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. We'll study these churches in detail in chapters 2 and 3. But these were actual churches that existed at the time, and they were known by those names. These seven churches existed in seven cities that bore that same name. Like, the church of Ephesus existed in the city of Ephesus. The church of Philadelphia existed in the city of Philadelphia. Now, these seven churches all of them existed in Asia Minor, in what is now West uh, Turkey. And they were located on a Roman road, on a circular Roman road. Now, if you start with Ephesus and go north to Smyrna, and then from Smyrna to Pergamos, then you go south to Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and then you go east to Laodicea. So, these churches were situated along a circular road. Okay, it started from Ephesus, went north, then went south, and then uh, east. turned around uh, eastward. Now, these were not the only seven churches that existed in, in Asia Minor. Like there was the Church of Colossae, there was the Church of Galatia, uh, there was the Church of Hierapolis. Why were these seven churches selected? I believe because each of them had a characteristic that portrays 
the history of the church or the condition of the church, universal church, during different uh, times, during different eras. We'll find, we'll study that later on when we, when we go to chapters 2 and 3 and we study each one of these churches in great detail. But now suffice it to know that these were not the only seven churches that existed in Asia Minor, but they were selected, I believe, because each church had a characteristic that described the church, the universal church, during a different period in history. Now we go to verse 12. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest, his head and hair were white like wool, as white snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire, his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Okay, so now John tells us what he heard. He told us what he heard. Now he is telling us what he saw. He saw a seven golden, he saw seven golden lampstands. Uh, this is the Jewish menorah. You know, have you seen the Jewish menorah? It has seven lampstands. So, and in the temple of Jerusalem there was a golden lampstand placed in the holy place of the temple. So he saw this golden lamps, he saw seven, meaning, we said seven means completion, perfection, and among the seven, the seven lampstands, I believe, represent the seven churches, we'll find out a little bit later. And he saw someone who looked like the Son of Man, Jesus, walking among the seven lampstands. If the seven lampstands represent the church, so here Jesus is seen walking among the seven churches. Now, he describes us. His robe was white, indicating righteousness. His hair was white. In uh, Hebrew thought and imagery, white hair indicates wisdom. Okay, so here Jesus is portrayed with, with a head covered with white hair, meaning that he, uh, this is a reference to his wisdom. His eyes were like uh, blazing fire, meaning his eyes were penetrating. He could see with his eyes what's the hidden thoughts of human beings. Uh, Jesus could know, could tell what people are hiding in their hearts and in their minds. So he had penetrating eyes and his feet were like bronze, meaning bronze indicates stability and strength. And in his mouth, from his mouth came a double-edged sword. The double-edged sword is, refers to the Bible. Hebrews 4, chap, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. There we're told that God's word is like a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. It penetrates through the marrow into the bones, into the innermost being. Meaning the word of God has a convicting power. It can penetrate through the hearts of people uh, and, and get into their innermost being to influence them. So the double-edged sword, according to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, is the word of God. Okay, now verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet. When he saw this glorious being, John fell at his feet as though dead. 
Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. So, <clears throat> Jesus comforts John, says, uh, Don't be afraid. He places his hand on him. He blesses him. He tells him, I am the first and the last. I was dead, but I am alive. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Hades is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Sheol. In Hebrew, Sheol is the abode of the dead, meaning the grave. And Hades, in Greek, means uh, the same thing, the grave. Here we're told that Jesus controls or has power over death. He has power over death. He has the keys of death, meaning he has control and power over death. Write, therefore, this is the second command to John to write. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in the right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. You remember I told you that those menorahs, the seven lampstands, represent the church? Here, the Bible explains itself, tells us the seven golden lampstands represent the churches, and the stars are the angels. Now, the Greek word for angel is angelos, and angelos in Greek means angel, but it, its basic meaning is messenger. So, the seven angels of the seven churches would be the messengers God had sent to those seven churches. Those messengers could be their pastors the pastors of the seven churches. Jesus is holding them, upholding them in his hand. He, he upholds the minister of the church. He, he walks among his people, he walks among the churches because he, walks, he was seen walking among the seven lampstands and the seven lampstands represent the churches. Jesus is ever present with his people and he upholds the ministry of the church. The angels of the church, as I said, angel, the basic meaning of angel is messenger in Greek. Angelos means messenger, and it also means angels, but the primary meaning is, is messenger. It could also mean the messengers with whom John sent the book of Revelation to the seven churches. The emissaries who carried the book of Revelation, the copy of the book of Revelation to the churches, those who the reference could be to those. Uh, or it could refer to the pastors, the spiritual leaders of the seven churches. So we come to the end of today's Bible study. If you have any questions, I would be glad to answer them. <coughs> if, you have any, if you have any questions, this is your opportunity <laughs> to ask. I'm not hearing. Uh, and that she will unmute. Yeah. No, I'm just grateful for Baga Belly, um, clear and concise, and all of the history surrounding. Because this is difficult, you know, as a lay person to read. So Baga this is wonderful. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for your appreciation. Any other questions or comments? <laughs> I am also very glad to share my knowledge with you to help you better understand the Word of God. Yeah, I it's, just wanted to thank you. You put us back in Jesus' time. We understood it. Yeah. Looking at it through your eyes, how you know it's written back at the time.
Thank you so much. An introduction. Uh, yeah, the, the key to how things are going to come up in the next chapters. Yes, yeah. Next, uh, chapter 2 deals with some of the seven churches, and chapter 3 also deals with the seven. So the seven churches are described in detail in chapters 2 and 3, which we'll, we will study next week. And the following, maybe two weeks. Yeah, it will take us two weeks. As I said, each week we'll try to cover one chapter. Covering more than one chapter would be too much. <laughs> like a mystery book. You can pick up a novel and you read it. It's exciting and you want, you don't want to put down the book. You want to read it cover to cover and in one uh, seven hour long session you can uh, read a book that consists of 300, 400 pages. But here, here we have a lot of history, a lot of symbols involved and explaining those symbols takes time. And I also want to give you enough time to digest. <laughs> uh, if you are overfed, you will have indigestion. <laughs> so, we'll keep the morsels small. 